Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Hello, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to our community television program, Public Science. Tonight's guest, addresses a major public issue, the widespread use of psychiatric medications in our society, and more particularly, the long-term effects of many of those drugs. Robert Whitaker is a widely acclaimed science writer. He's the author of Mad in America and the Mapmaker's Wife, in addition to his latest and highly praised book that he'll discuss here, Anatomy of an Epidemic. In this book, he takes up the issue of psychiatric medication. Drugs that initially seem so promising for treatment of many types of mental impairment, such as anxiety, depression, ADHD, bipolarism, and schizophrenia, have actually led to an epidemic of mental and cognitive problems. Whitaker provides us with the historical background, the data, and the politics of these medications. Although he's been very busy on his latest book signing tour, he's generously agreed to give a presentation about the many challenges he encountered in developing the information in this book. I think what he reveals will make all of us more aware of how vigilant modern citizens must become. By bringing this information to the public in such a thorough and clear manner, he has performed a major public service. After his talk, Robert Whitaker will take questions. Please keep in mind that this program is being recorded, and if you ask a question, you are in effect giving us permission to record you. This program will be aired on Belmont Media Center stations, and it will be accessible on Blip TV via a link on the Science for the Public website. This program will also be accessible on the WGBH PBS Forum Network and a link will be provided on the Science for the Public website when the page is set up on the network. And now we're very honored to welcome Robert Whitaker. Thank you for having me. Um, it is uh, both a pleasure and an honor to be here tonight, and I thank you for this invitation. And what really pleased me about this invitation is Yvonne asked me not just to talk about the book, and I have been talking a lot about the book, but really about the challenges as a journalist in writing this type of book. And actually, it's a, it's a question I haven't spoken about before, but it is a question that uh, I dealt with the whole time I was researching this book, the whole time I was reporting this book, and it really does raise a profound question as to how the public gets its information and who should be delivering the information. And so one of the things we're going to be looking about tonight is the journalist's role and really maybe the medical profession's role in, in talking to the public and delivering information to the public. Because I think you'll see by the end of this talk, the question is why am I having to deliver this information as a journalist? Maybe it should have come to you in other, really from the medical community, okay? Um, here's the dilemma as a journalist when you, write, when you begin that this book presents, okay? What is the book about? The book is about a medical puzzle. And when we look at uh, what our society knows about psychiatric medications, the story our, our society has told itself goes like this. In 1955, Thorazine arrived in, in asylum medicine, and this was the first antipsychotic medication. And this ushered in a psychopharmacological revolution, this great leap forward in our care of mental disorders. We got antipsychotics, we got antidepressant drugs, we got anti-anxiety drugs. And as the story goes, uh, Thorazine is what made it possible to empty the state hospitals and take care of the severely mentally ill in the community. That's a step forward. You hear in the names a sense that we've now discovered drugs that are antidotes to mental disorders. Think about this, antipsychotics. Apparently, they're doing something specific to psychosis, antidepressants. All that tells you of sort of drugs that fit into almost an antibiotic model of medicine. Think of the anti word. Okay, and then the next part of this story that we believe in is that these drugs, in fact, fix chemical imbalances in the brain. We've all heard this, that mental disorders were discovered to be caused by chemical imbalances, and these are antidotes to those chemical imbalances. And then going forward, we even have this sense that this revolution in care has unfolded in two steps. 
We had a first generation of psychiatric medications, Thorazine, um, you know, the tricyclic antidepressants, Valium, etc. And then beginning in 1987, Prozac arrived on the market, and this was the first of the second generation psychiatric drugs. And the second generation, that was the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, new antidepressants. They were said to be better than the old tricyclics. And then we got what are known as atypical antipsychotics, things, drugs like Zyprexa and Risperdal. They were said to be better than the old standard antipsychotics. And so if you really hear this, it's a revolution that unfolded in two steps. And by the way, if you look in 1998, a U.S. Surgeon General at that time, uh, David Satcher, wrote a, a, a treatise on mental health in this country, and that's the story he told. He said, before the arrival of Thorazine, psychiatry lacked treatments that could prevent people from becoming chronically ill. Then we got these drugs, and today we enjoy a, wide, a number of treatments that are safe and effective for mental disorders. So it's a story of medical progress of a leap forward. <coughs> now, was the first thing that I did in this book was look at a very simple metric, and that is the number of dis disabled mentally ill in our society, and, and also look on a per capita basis, and how has it changed during, as this revolution has unfolded. Because, of course, we would expect that if we now have effective medications, that at the very least the per capita disability rate should stay the same or, in fact, go down, right? I mean, normally when you have effective medications, you see this increase in the ability of people to function well in society. So if you go back to 1955, at the start of the psychopharmacological revolution, there were about 565,000 in state and county mental hospitals. And that is seen at that time as the disabled mentally ill population. However, if you drill into that data a bit more, you find that about, there's only actually about 365,000 people with psychiatric diagnoses. The other 200,000 really were people with other types of ailments, ailments such as Alzheimer's disease, in-stage syphilis, alcoholism, not psychiatric problem. So we had about 365,000 people under state care at that time, and that's a disability rate of roughly 140, one in every 470 people, okay? Now, as researchers have tracked the number, the, the number of disabled mentally ill in our society forward into the era, uh, era of deinstitutionalization, it's not an exact, it's not a, an exact uh, metric that y as you go forward, but what they've looked at is how many people receive SSI or SSDI, these are government disability payments, because they're disabled by mental illness, okay? That means they're on government care because they can't function well enough in society to, to earn their living. And that's, that's not my metric, tr tracking this forward. That's what other researchers have done. So I'm just following in their path, okay? 1987, at the moment that Prozac arrives in the market, we have one in every, uh, excuse me, sorry. We have 1.25 million people on SSI and SSDI in 1987 when Prozac arrives. That's a disability rate, excuse me, of roughly one in every 184. So we went from one in 468 to one in every 184. Now from, from 1987 forward, we, we have the same metric, right? We're just gonna follow the people on SSI or on SSDI. And, and so we get these new drugs and we really embrace this form of care, right? Since Prozac arrived, sales of uh, psychiatric medications, we spent about 800 million in 1987. Today we're spending over $40 billion in the United States annually on psychiatric medications. Antidepressants, by the way, we spend more on antidepressants in the United States than the gross national product of Cameroon. Gives you a sense of how, how much we've embraced this form of care. What's happened to the SSI and SSDI numbers since Prozac arrived? In the next 20 years, the number of people on government disability due to mental illness tripled. It went to four million people. Today, we, every day in the United States, 365 days a year, 850 adults are being added to the SSI and SSDI roles due to mental illness, okay? That's quite an epidemic, actually. There's another thing that you look at if you look at the disability numbers. What's happening to the children if they're severely mentally ill, their families and caregivers can also get an SSI payment. In 1987, there were 16,200 children in America who received a, a payment because of a mental disorder, mental illness, all right? We now start medicating kids. Today, it's 600,000. And now there's 250 children per day going on SSI. And the other thing you see that's happening to these children, they hit age 18, they're going right on to a lifelong disability. They're going on to the government program. So you see a medical puzzle set up. 
We have a societal belief that these medications represent a revolutionary advance in the treatment of mental disorders. And I will say, and I think we all know this is true, do we know that the psychiatric medications can help people during times of acute psychiatric distress? Absolutely. I think that's true. We've seen people helped in that way. Do we know, in fact, that many people stabilize well on the medications? Yes, we do. Okay, I know that too. I know that. I know many such people. And you can hear those voices in our society. At the same time, however, and here comes the puzzle, we have this extraordinary rise in a disability rate that seems at odds with the story of a revolutionary advance in care. And once that necessarily raises a question. It seems, it seems odd, but here's the question. Is it possible that our drug-based paradigm of care, for some unforeseen reason, is in fact fueling this epidemic? All right, and that's the puzzle I'm asking in here. And once you raise that question, you really have two subsidiary questions that you're going to want to look at in the scientific literature. One is, you're going to want to look at how do psychiatric medications affect the long-term course of major mental disorders? Schizophrenia, and I do it for four major adult disorders in the book, schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder. Do they shift it, the long-term course for the better? In other words, make it more likely people are able to work, that they're going to be less symptomatic, more functional? Or for some odd reason, when we look at outcomes in the aggregate, do you see, in fact, that they shift outcomes for the worse? compared to this sort of natural spectrum of outcomes. It sort of increase the risk of disability. Um, increase the fact that the amount of time people spend symptomatic. And that's one of the things we're going to want to look and see what the scientific literature has to say about that question. All right, and you can see it's a valid scientific question. The other possibility when you look at this disability data is this. Is it possible that uh, you take a person with a mild psychiatric problem, let's say a mild bout of depression, you put them, they go in and they get treated with a psychiatric medication, say an antidepressant, and let's say they now have a bad reaction to that drug. Let's say that with the depressed person on an antidepressant ends up having a manic episode in response. Now this is well known that this can occur, then once they have that manic episode, what's going to happen? They're going to be diagnosed now with bipolar. And now they've moved from a milder problem into a much more severe problem, and the disability rate for bipolar is much higher than for depression. So you can see in that possibility basically an iatrogenic or drug cause pathway that you may have a, a certain percentage of people have a bad re come in with a mild problem, have a bad reaction to a drug, and end up on this path to disability. Okay, so that's the two possibilities we want to look at as we go through the scientific literature. Now, why does doing this book present a problem for a journalist? And it does, it presents a big problem. And it's one that I really struggled with as I wrote this book. On the one hand, it's a, it seems like an obvious thing for a journalist to do, OK? We have a societal problem. I mean, the disability numbers are not good. I mean, obviously, that's not a good outcome. Our spending on, on, on mental disorders in this country doubled in the last eight years. So you can see we want to make change. We want to get better outcomes. So this seems like something a journalist should focus on. But the problem is, by even raising those questions, and you can see it, I'm raising a, a, a heretical question. Our society believes this. Our psychiatric establishment believes these drugs represented a profound leap forward in medical care. So it's a question that seems at odds with what society knows to be true. It's at odds what psychiatry knows to be true. The medical establishment knows to be true. So right away, I'm in this sort of heretical position. And the other problem for a journalist is this. What does a medical journalist normally do? Well, normally they go to the experts, in essence, and their job is to sort of, in essence, translate what those experts say is true for the general public. But by the very sort of nature of the question I'm asking here and the medical puzzle, I'm really in this position of possibly saying to the medical profession, you don't know your own scientific literature, and you're deluded. That's really, so I'm in this odd position in relationship to the experts in the field. And it's a really profoundly sort of difficult position and uncomfortable position to be. Now, because Yvonne uh, asked me to sort of talk also about a journalist role, I want to tell you how I ended up here. Okay, a little bit of the history. How did I end up asking this heretical question? 
Uh, I've been writing about medicine and science really about 20 years. And what happened was in 1989, and I'd been a newspaper reporter covering general stuff before that. In 1989, I was at the Albany, uh, Albany Times Union newspaper, and I was made the features reporter covering medicine and science. So this began my career as, as covering, writing about medicine and science. I do that for a few years there. In 1992, I came to Cambridge on a, a fellowship at MIT, a night science journalism fellowship. It's a mainstream fellowship. Shortly after that, I actually left daily newspapers. I, for a while, was the uh, director of um, publications at Harvard Medical School. You can see I'm all right in the mainstream here. Um, after that, I actually left that to co-found a company called Center Watch that reported on the business acts aspects of um, the clinical development of new drugs. Who were our readers? I mean, it was regular journalism. Our readers were pharmaceutical companies, academic medical centers, doctors. So I'm absolutely in the mainstream up at this time. And then in 1998, um, during this time I had that company, I also continued to write magazine articles occasionally and newspaper articles. And in the summer of 1998, while I still had this company, I stumbled upon some problems of sort of the abuse of psychiatric patients in research settings. So I said, aha, let me. But let me go take this, I'll make a proposal to the Boston Globe to do a series on this. They accepted it, and so we did a four-part series. Now, during that four-part series, one of the things we focused on as unethical were studies that involved a withdrawing antipsychotic medications from schizophrenia patients. Now, why would that be unethical, or why did I think it was unethical? Well, it was because my understanding at the time was that schizophrenia was caused by too much dopamine in the brain, right? And the drugs blocked dopamine activity, and therefore they helped balance the dopaminergic pathways. They helped fix the root cause of schizophrenia. And so we said, well, it's, and as I called up people, and they said the drugs are like insulin for diabetes. That's what the experts told me. Well, then I said, well, why would you ever withdraw antipsychotic medications from schizophrenics? You wouldn't do, from people with schizophrenia, you wouldn't, would you ever draw, withdraw, do studies with, where you withdrew insulin from diabetics? You wouldn't do it, right? So we write that this is abusive, and it's, you know, it's an example of abuse of psychiatric patients. And, and that series, by the way, we did other abuses as well. It won some awards. It won a George Polk Award. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. So at this point, I'm absolutely comfortable as a medical journalist. I'm following a mainstream thing. But what happens? As I was doing the reporting for that series, I came upon two studies that I didn't know what, two outcome studies related to schizophrenia that totally didn't make sense. The first one was a, a study by Harvard medical researchers that looked at outcomes for schizophrenia patients, and this was published, I think, in 1994. And they had found that outcomes for schizophrenia patients had actually declined in the past 15 years, and here's the kicker, and were now no better than they were in 1900 when water therapies were the order of the day. Now remember, I'm a believer at this point in the story of progress, and now all of a sudden I come upon this big picture outcome study, and they say things haven't improved since 1900. It sort of belies that story of progress. Now, then I also looked at, there was also uh, studies by the World Health Organization, and these studies went back to 1969. And what it did, in the World Health Organization had done, is they had compared outcomes <laughs> in three, three poor countries of the world, schizophrenia outcomes, specifically India, Colombia, and Nigeria, with outcomes in the US and seven, six other rich countries. They do this one time, and they find it's a five-year study, and they find that outcomes are much better in the poor countries of the world. They wonder, well, how can that be? So they're going to repeat the study. And by the way, the diagnoses are being made by Western doctors, OK? And uh, they hypothesized, as they repeated this study, well, maybe the reason, oh, and by the way, stop for a second. They concluded that the outcomes were so different, the divergence in outcomes was so profound, that living in a developed country was a strong predictor that a person would never fully recover from schizophrenia. So there's this real sense of failure. And so they hypothesized that, in fact, maybe the thing is in the poor countries, people are more medication compliant. They take their medications more regularly. So they looked at medication usage in that second study. Now, two things happened in the second study. Indeed, once again, they said our first, outcome, our first findings are confirmed. Outcomes are much better in the poor countries of the world. Then they looked at medication usage. And here comes the surprise. In the poor countries of the world, only 16% of patients were regularly maintained on antipsychotic medications. 
Whereas, of course, in the developed countries, that was the standard of care. So you can see why these gave me pause. These ran exactly, contra they directly contradicted what I had just written about in the Boston Globe, which was that you should never take people with schizophrenia off their antipsychotic medications. That's abusive. We know they fix chemical imbalances. So I was left with this sense of confusion. And what I did at that point is I got a contract to write Mad in America, this first book, that really was, ended up two things. <clears throat> One, it became a, um, a history of the treatment of the severely mentally ill in our society, okay, from colonial times till today. But the second part of the book really was to look at this modern failure. Why are outcomes better in the poor countries of the world than they are here, right? And also to look at this question of medication usage. Is there some reason that the fact that they're not keeping everybody on medication in the poor countries of the world, is that in some reason actually helping get better outcomes? And by the way, in that WHO study, the World Health Organization study, by far the best outcomes were in rural India, and there they had almost nobody on their medications long term. All right, so that's um, how I got to uh, Madden America. Uh, real quickly, uh, you know, I go through the, the research literature, mainstream research literature, and when you do that, indeed, and we're going to go through this in just a minute, so you'll see what the science has to say, but you do come at the end to understand why sort of a selective use of the meds would in fact lead to better outcomes. So I publish that book, and what happens? This was my first experience as a heretic <laughs> in, in our society. Some people, you know, many people like the book. Other, you know, certain reviewers praised it. It's now taught in certain colleges. And other people just damned it big time, and especially psychiatrists. Um, uh, my favorite review of this sort was uh, written by a Chicago uh, uh, psychiatrist. And his opening line of his review was this. If Fox Television ever wants to do a show on good journalists gone bad, they can start with Robert Whittaker and Mad in America. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the point is, it's a difficult position to be a journalist contradicting sort of conventional wisdom, even though the only thing I did in this book, and you're going to see it in a second, is look at what the mainstream research actually showed, long-term studies. Okay, I was doing nothing more than what any sort of evidence-based reviewer would do. That book comes out, uh, as uh, Yvonne said, I then wrote another, I wanted to get away from psychiatry, frankly, Wrote another book called uh, Matt Maker's Wife, nonfiction, and another book called On the Laps of God, which deals with the racial massacre and a court case. But I kept being asked to speak about this topic, and finally someone asked me to do a paper on this topic, and I said, okay, and to expand beyond schizophrenia. So I said, let me look at the disability data. I looked at it, and you've got the same problem, in essence, that I saw with schizophrenia, is that something doesn't add up. So that's how I ended up writing this book. But you can see it, I guess the point of this is this. I was a believer, <laughs> and I followed actually a very traditional journalistic path to writing this book. And that was trying to solve a puzzle, trying to solve a problem, OK? Now the way what we're going to do in, in Anatomy of an Epidemic, what I do is I, I, like I do is I chart the long-term outcomes literature for um, as I said, four disorders, schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder. Um, and in doing that, I also look, is there, are we going to find iatrogenic pathways as well? And then I look at what's happening to children. Uh, when we look at long-term outcomes, as you know, we've, we've embarked, at this, embarked in this extraordinary medical experiment where we are medicating a sizable percentage of our children. And how's that turning out? How are those children doing long-term? Okay, And that's the second part of the book. Now, Sort of as a first uh, step on this, it's, I want to um, talk about the evidence base. What we're going to do here, excuse me, we're going to do this for antipsychotics again. And there's a reason we're going to do it. What's we're going to spend the most of the time, and then I'll, I'll go real quickly on the antidepressants and bipolar, et cetera. The reason I thought it would be good to focus on antipsychotics is this. If there's any class of drugs that we as a society should be sure has a benefit, it's antipsychotics for schizophrenia. I mean, I'm talking about as a benefit for improving outcomes in the, on the whole, in the aggregate, OK? Um, and, there, and in fact, of course, our society is, is, is um, set up, in fact, to ensure that people so diagnosed take these drugs. Sometimes they're under court orders to take these drugs. If not, there's a lot of sort of social pressure to do so. So given that our society behaves in this way, 
there should be a really solid evidence base stretching back 50 years that says this is an evidence-based good thing to do with basically everybody with schizophrenia. Okay? Does that make sense? So if we find a, a, uh, something that contradicts that, boy, this would be quite surprising if we find an evidence base. So what is the evidence base for the use of these medications? And there, of course, is an evidence base. If, I, if you had brought in a psychiatrist, he'd say, oh, we, we have our evidence base. And it consists of two parts. If you take 100 people with psychotic symptoms, okay, and you randomize them into two arms, and one group you give, and let's say they're newly psychotic, and you give one group drug and one group placebo, at the end of six weeks, no question, the psychotic symptoms have abated more in the drug-treated group, okay? And that means that's why they're considered efficacious for FDA purposes. They curb acute episodes of psychosis better than placebo. And there's a lot of evidence to show that that is indeed true. I mean, in other words, there's been many studies of this type. Now, once people are on medications, the question is, how long should they stay on them, right? And what uh, psych psychiatry did to study that uh, question is they ran what are known as relapse studies or withdrawal studies. They would take uh, schizophrenia patients who had stabilized well on the medications, and they have to be stabilized because they basically have to be asymptomatic. And now, of the 100 responders, good responders, they'll take 50 and keep them on the drug. And the other 50, they'll abruptly withdraw from the medication. Okay? And sure enough, those abruptly withdrawn, time and time again, relapse at a greater rate. And so researchers said, psychiatric, psychiatric researchers said, aha, you see, when we withdraw the medication, the disease returns, the disease symptoms return. Therefore, the drug must be preventing the relapse of uh, the return of the disorder. They're preventing relapse, okay? And that becomes a, an evidence-based rationale for maintaining people on medications. And if you go into the research literature and you see what is our evidence base, those are the two forms of evidence base they have. Okay, what's missing? There's nothing in that evidence base that tells you anything about increasing employment rates, increasing functionality in society. The relapse just tells you whether they're going back to uh, hospitals and all. But there's another thing. Imagine we run a different study. Imagine we run a study with 100 people, first episode, people with schizophrenia. And now we put 50 on medication, we start them down the medication path, and we keep the other 50, we don't expose them to medication at all. Okay? This group is basically going to be the natural spectrum of outcomes for schizophrenia. Right? What is, do we have any information that this drug-treated group really is doing better long-term than this never-exposed group? Is it beating sort of the natural spectrum of outcomes for schizophrenia? We don't know. That the evidence base doesn't tell us that. And in, in 2002, Emmanuel Stipp, who's a, a psychiatrist, well-known psychiatrist at the University of Montreal, he writes an editorial on European psychiatry. And here's what he says. After 50 years of neuroleptics, are we able to answer the following simple question? And neuroleptics are antipsychotics, okay? Are neuroleptics effective in treating schizophrenia? There was, he said, quote, no compelling evidence on the matter when long-term is considered. Okay, this is his major review of the literature. And then he says this. He says, if we wish to base psychiatry on evidence-based medicine, we run a genuine risk in taking a closer look at what has long been considered fact. Now, why is this important? It shows that the uh, endeavor I'm going to have in this book, looking at the long, how uh, long-term outcomes are altered, is in fact not heretical from a scientific point of view. It's actually what the mainstream psychiatry says we need to be doing. All right? It's heretical from a political point of view. It's heretical sort of from a financial point of view. It's, it's so, but that's where the heresy comes from. It actually does not come from within psychiatry. What mainstream psychiatry says is we lack evidence that we're improving the long-term outcomes for the better. Okay, so can you indeed, excuse me just for a second, can, but if you look at Emmanuel Stipp, he's saying we lack evidence. He's not saying we, we're finding that maybe the evidence is there showing we're worsening outcomes, or in fact that maybe drugs should be used in a different manner. So what my challenge is, is to go through the mainstream scientific literature studies done by the NIMH, by the World Health Organization, and see if we can put together a story of how drugs indeed affect the long-term course of schizophrenia. All right? And think of this as a model that we're going to apply for depression in the book, anxiety in the book, bipolar disorder in the book, and really with the children as well. Okay, the first thing you want to try to do is find out what were outcomes like before the drugs were introduced. 
say from 1945 to 1955. Now the understanding is that people with schizophrenia became chronically ill, right? They're just going to, they're going to be in the hospitals, they're not going to get out. Well, if you actually go to the epidemiological literature for 1945, you immediately are surprised. Because they did do many studies of first episode, of people with first episode schizophrenia, and here's what they found time and time again. At the end of five years, from that moment of first hospitalization, roughly 70% would be out living in the community. And, and discharge rates, actually discharge rates within 18 months, you'd be at 65, 70%. But at the end of five, six years, 70% would be living in the community. Okay, now by the way, they're not on disability because there's no disability framework in our society at that time outside of the mental hospitals. Employment rates, as best as I can find, are at least 50% and up. Many of the women, in fact, are married. So they're, they're, remember we're back in the 50s, not that many people are working outside, but they have this what's called an, uh, the customary social role or something like that. They're functioning in that social role, over 50%. By the way, there's a study in England that looked at this question too, same thing. Over 50% of their people were functioning okay. People with schizophrenia five years later were functioning okay in society, meaning able to take care of themselves. All right, so that gives you a, a little bit different understanding of a baseline sort of outcomes for schizophrenia. Real quickly, did these drugs uh, enable deinstitutionalization? That's the second part of our story. Uh, two key bits of information. In 19, the Thorazine comes in 1955. The real study that looked at whether uh, these drugs are in sort of in accelerating discharge rates was done by California, it's, I think it's 1958, 1959. It looked at all of its first episode schizophrenia patients admitted in two years in all of its hospitals, and it found two things. One, that the discharge rate for those not treated with medication, because not everybody was being treated as a matter of course, was 88% within 18 months, I think it was. The discharge rate for those treated with uh, neuroleptics was 74%. It was actually lower. The other thing they found was that um, hospitals were adopting a new form of care at, at varying rates, that hospitals that used the drugs the least had the highest discharge rates. The hospitals that used the drugs the most had the lowest discharge rates. So all you can say is in terms of first episode schizophrenia patients, that is an evidence that these accelerated the discharge of those first episode patients. As far as the chronic load, in 1955 there were about 265,000 uh, schizophrenia mm -hmm. patients in the hospitals. Uh, eight years later, it hadn't budged really. It was about 10,000 people less. So when does deinstitutionalization of the chronic happen? It happens when we pass Medicare and Medicaid legislation, which says to the states, if you shift your chronic patients from the state mental hospitals to nursing homes or shelters in the community, we'll pay half of that money. Okay, it was really a uh, legislative change that led to deinstitutionalization. Okay, now, the long-term outcomes literature. The first good study of antipsychotic medications was done in the early 1960s. It was done by the NIMH. It has four arms, four different groups. Three of the groups get treated with an antipsychotic. It's just there's three different antipsychotics. The fourth is treated with placebo. After six weeks, there's no question the drug-treated groups are doing better. Okay, their psychotic symptoms have abated to a, a greater degree. However, if you look at the placebo arm, there are many patients that in fact are getting better, just as not as fast. And that becomes actually the study that launches the sense that these are effective drugs. Still cited today. What doesn't get cited today is the one-year follow-up study. And one year later, the researchers found something odd. They found that those treated with placebo actually were less likely to be re-hospitalized than any of the drug-treated groups at the end of one year. A lower rehospitalization rate. Now, drug usage is not controlled real well, and it's not controlled at all in that year, so we don't really know uh, drug exposure. But right at the beginning of the research outcomes literature, we see the hint of a paradox. Drugs that are effective over the short term, for some reason, may be increasing the chronicity of the disorder of the long term. And this really is the very first study we have that looks gives us any sort of long term outcomes glimpse. Now, what you notice. Remember, doctors at this time in the 60s still have some memory of treating people without meds, schizophrenic patients without meds. And they start noticing people are relapsing real frequently now. And they say they're coming back to the hospital in droves. And they label this the revolving door syndrome. So it seems like people are now coming back more frequently than before. And they notice something else too. They notice that people on meds are actually having more severe relapses 
or people who've been exposed than those who have never been exposed. So not only does it seem like they're coming back more frequently, it seems like they're having more severe relapses. Okay, so the, this leads in the 1970s to the NIMH to run three trials where they revisit this question of whether patients really are best served over the long term by being treated with, with antipsychotic medications. And here was the design of the three studies, and I actually like the design, basically. We're going to have an experimental arm, okay, and in the experimental arm we're not going to put the newly psychotic patients, the newly schizophrenic patients on meds, on antipsychotic medications. But if after four, six weeks they're not getting better, then we are. Okay, so it's a selective use. And what we're going to see if there's a percentage of people anyway that can get better without being put on the meds. And then the other arm is going to be treated conventionally. Okay, so it's not really a no drug arm, it's let's call it a selective drug arm. And the other thing that's key to understand in this experimental group, it's not just placebo treatment. They're going to get sort of psychosocial care, community care. And we're going to see if we can get people through these psychotic breaks with, with sort of that sort of environmental care. Does that make sense? Okay, what did they find in, and who runs these studies? One is done in-house by NIMH. A second one was done by Lauren Mosher, who's the head, head of the schizophrenia section at the NIMH. And the third is done by a guy named Maurice Rappaport at the University of San Francisco, uh, in Cal University of California at San Francisco. The point is, this is mainstream stuff, okay? It's NIMH stuff. All three studies basically have the same result. And the same result is this, that the experimental arms have better results overall in the aggregate, the sort of selective use medication, that's number one. Number two, at least 40% of the patients in the experimental arm get better and stay better in follow-up periods that range from one to three years without ever having been exposed to antipsychotic medication. Okay, there's apparently some group that can get better and stay better, that's the second finding. And the third finding is that it's this group that somehow can get through that psychotic break without being exposed to medication that has the best overall long-term outcomes, the best functioning. Okay, and I just want to read to you what the findings were in the 1970s from these three studies. Here's Maurice Rappaport, and he's one of the, he ran a three-year study. He says, our findings suggest that antipsychotic medication is not the treatment of choice, at least for certain patients, if one is interested in long-term clinical improvement. Many unmedicated while in hospital patients showed greater long-term improvement, less pathology at follow-up, fewer rehospitalizations, and better overall functioning in the community than patients who were given chlorpromazine, that's thorazine, while in the hospital. Okay, that's one finding. Here's Lauren Mosher of the second group. Okay, he's the head doc, head schizophrenia doctor in our country at the time. He says, contrary to popular views, Minimal use of antipsychotic medications combined with specially designed psychosocial intervention for patients newly identified with schizophrenia spectrum disorder is not harmful but appears to be advantageous. We think that the balance of risks and benefits associated with the common practice of medicating nearly all early episodes of psychosis should be reexamined. Okay, again, what do you see here? You see uh, this sense that if we're interested in long term, we should have sort of selective use of care. The third guy, William Carpenter, said, here's what I think is happening. It seems like those who go through their psychotic break unmedicated actually are learning some coping strategies. And he says, those that didn't, um, and then when he said in that, by going through the psychosis in this way, they are better able to cope with subsequent life stresses. So there actually was some advantage for some people for going through the uh, symptoms in this way. But then he raises a really key question. I'm talking about William Carpenter. And it's really sort of an oh God moment for psychiatry. He says, there is no question that once patients are placed on medication, they are less vulnerable to relapse if maintained on neuroleptics. But what if these patients had never been treated with drugs to begin with? We raise the possibility that antipsychotic medication may make some schizophrenia patients more vulnerable to future relapse than would be the case in the natural course of the illness. So he's saying at this moment, maybe these drugs actually increase the biological vulnerability of psychosis over the long term. That's why you're getting these increased relapse rates, et cetera. And you can see why this is such a problem for psychiatry is that all drugs have a risk-benefit profile. If we're making people more, and the benefit obviously with antipsychotics is we knock down psychosis. But if they're increasing the vulnerability to that target symptom, where is the benefit, at least in the aggregate, okay? And um, at that time, by the way, uh, uh, two researchers from the University of Montreal, 
uh, Guichenard and Barry Jacobs, Barry Jones, excuse me, came up with a biological explanation for what is going on. And it's really sort of brilliant science. And here's what they said. Um, Psychiat uh, antipsychotic drugs work by blocking dopamine receptors in the brain. And they actually block somewhere between 70 90 percent of a particular dopamine receptor called the D2 receptor. Okay? So it puts the brake on dopamine transmission. Now, the theory had been, of course, that people with schizophrenia had overactive dopamine systems. Um, and they investigated that. And uh, let's see if I can do this real quickly. So here's the thought here's how neurotransmitter systems act in the brain. So this is the thought of what causes schizophrenia. You have presynaptic neurons that release dopamine into the synaptic, neuro, synaptic cleft, and then that, that molecule binds with receptors on the postsynaptic neurons. So the theory was that with schizophrenia, either these presynaptic neurons put out too much dopamine, okay, or conversely there were too many dopamine receptors, uh, uh, too many receptors on the postsynaptic neurons. One of two things happened. They investigate this, and it, um, they find that's in unmedicated patients, that's not so, okay? And in fact, I, it, I could tell you how they investigate it, but it takes some time. But for example, Stephen Hyman, in his 2000, Stephen Hyman is the provost at Harvard University. He's the former director of the NIMH. He's a neuroscientist, and in his book, uh, 2002 book, Molecular Neuropharmacology, he sums up this whole research into the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, and he says, there is no compelling evidence that a lesion in the dopamine system is a primary cause of schizophrenia. They just didn't find that chemical imbalance in unmedicated patients, okay? But what happens to medicated patients? And what the Montreal guy, what was found was this. The drugs act as, an, as a break on dopamine transmission. The brain says, uh-oh, that's a problem. And it tries to compensate for that break. And it does so in two ways. The presynaptic neurons, for at least a period of time, now start pumping out extra dopamine. Okay? That start trying to put the accelerator down. And the postsynaptic neurons increase the density of their dopamine receptors. Now the brain is super sensitive to dopamine. So the drugs were actually found to cause the very sort of pathology or abnormality that was uh, hypothesized to cause psychosis in the first place. And that's the increase, the, these guys say, that's the increase biological vulnerability. You can see, again, we have this other oh my god moment. And they say, for example, neuroleptics, I'm talking about uh, uh, Chouinard, Chouinard and Jones, they say neuroleptics can produce a dop dopamine supersensitivity that leads to both dyskinetic and psychotic symptoms. An implication is that the tendency towards psychotic relapse in a patient who has developed such a supersensitivity, and they all do, is determined by more than just the normal cor course of the illness. Okay? Now, let, let's now go back to the withdrawal studies. Remember what's happening. You go on drug, it blocks, acts as a break. Brain responds by putting down the accelerator. Okay? Now let's abruptly withdraw the break. What do you got left? You got an accelerator down. And this is the reason they said you're getting all these severe relapses, because they are now indeed in an unbalanced state. Okay, does that make sense? But then they said, but now let's look at what's happening long term. Imagine a car you drive where you've got the accelerator down and the brake down at the same time. It might sort of be uh, wear on the car. And they said, it looks like the same thing happens to the dopaminergic pathways. They start to become dysfunctional after time. So for example, one of the pathways in the brain is to the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia controls motor movement. And they say, what do we see with patients that are on these drugs for a longer period of time? We start to see tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dyskinesia is, as often you'll see this, you'll see people licking their lips. And the tongue will just keep going around. That's just one of many symptoms. Why? Because the basal ganglia can no longer control tongue movement. So the basal, we see tardive dyskinesia, and that's a sign that the basal ganglia is actually uh, misfunctioning, okay? All right, so that's a sign it's beginning to be permanently dysfunctional. Well, and where's an, a second uh, pathway? It goes to the limbic system. The limbic system is seen as uh, uh, a mediator of psychosis. And these guys said, well, if we're getting dysfunction there, we're probably getting uh, dysfunction in the limbic system. And, they, and sure enough, they find that that happens as well. And by the way, these dysfunction seems to hit at about 5% per year. So after one year, 5% of patients have tardive dyskinesia. After two years, it's 10%. After three years, it's 15 And here's what they said. This leads to something we call tardive psychosis, 
and when this tardive psychosis sets in, the illness appears worse than ever before. New schizophrenic symptoms or original symptoms of greater severity will appear. The third sort of pathway goes to the frontal lobes. If that pathway starts to become dys dysfunctional, you, they said you're going to get cognitive decline, and sure enough, you see cognitive decline over time as well. So in 19, uh, I think it's 78, as this is all coming together, the science is coming together, Jonathan Cole, the father of American psychopharmacology, who did that very first study in the 1960s at the NIMH, he writes a uh, paper called, Is the Cure Worse Than the Disease? And he says, listen, we've got this problem. We've got tardive dyskinesia. We have this relapse problem. And he says, at the very, what our studies show is that at least 50% of patients treated with schizophrenia would do better off the meds. And he said, we urge all practitioners to give everybody a chance to go off their meds. Okay, because we want to avoid this long-term problem. So you see at this moment, 20 years into the revolution, there really is a sense in the science something has gone awry. And at the very least, we should have sort of selective use of the meds. OK, what happens after that? This story now gets lost. It gets hushed up. It's, we're no longer going to talk about this. And why not? What happens is in 1980, psychiatry undergoes, quote, basically a, a revolution within itself. Before this, we have sort of Freudian ideas about uh, mental disorders in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, and uh, we also have ideas of neurosis, et cetera. In 1980, they publish a new, new manual, DSM-3, and this new manual is going to present the, the medical model of disorders, that these are brain diseases, just like cancer, and schizophrenia is a brain disease like cancer, and if that is so, these people obviously need to be on the drugs for life. Now, the problem with DSM-3 is it was a political statement. It was a statement basically designed to revive psychiatry. It was designed to protect the prescribing powers of psychiatry. And, and, and sort of re because the sale of psychiatric drugs in the 1970s actually goes down. And psychiatry felt that it was in competition with a lot of therapists, social workers, psychologists. This was a way to revitalize psychiatry. And as part of this new story they committed to telling, this medical model story, is they no longer were willing to consider this sort of paradoxical long-term concern. They're no longer going to talk about supersensitive psychosis. They're just not going to talk about these problems that arose in the late 70s. Okay? We hush it up. So now, real quickly. What does research show since that time? Because now we all know in society people with schizophrenia need to be on these drugs. You all know that. I know that. I knew that in 1998. So was this concern that shows up in the 1970s that they're perhaps worsening the long-term disorder and people should be on selectively, does research then support that concern or does it in fact support the common understanding we have today all people with schizophrenia should be on drugs for life? Real quickly, we have MRI studies now. The MRI studies are done in the 1990s. They find that people, the medications do two things. They cause the basal ganglia to swell. They cause the frontal lobes to shrink over time. Then a researcher named Rachel Gurr at the University of Pennsylvania said, aha, maybe as these morphological changes happen, symptoms improve, which makes sense. If you believe the drugs work, as the drug comes in, causes change in the brain, symptoms will lessen. Unfortunately, they found the reverse that over the period of three years, as these changes in the brain happens, as the basal ganglia swells, you, these, this, these changes are associated with a worsening of positive symptoms, that's hallucinations, and a worsening of the negative oh, symptoms. Okay, yeah. Then the second thing that you have is you have a uh, MRI study done by Nancy Andreessen. Nancy Andreessen was the long-term uh, editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry. She started studying a large group of patients in the uh, early 1990s. She found that over time, and by the way, we're also talking about the atypical antipsychotics. These drugs do indeed shrink the frontal lobes. As that shrinkage occurs, you see a couple things. You see cognitive decline set in after about five years, and you also see a um, worsening of the negative symptoms, the lethargy. So the MRI studies, again, sort of support that worrisome pattern we saw in the, in the 1970s. And then we have what are known as observational studies. Real quickly, Courtney Harding from the University of Boston studied uh, the long-term outcomes of a group of patients that had been on the back wards of a Vermont, Vermont State Hospital in the 1950s. She looked at how they were doing 25, 30 years later, and here's what she found. In one part, really good news. One-third of those who were seen as hopeless were now completely recovered. They were working, good social lives, they were asymptomatic, they just weren't, quote, schizophrenic any anymore. All of them shared one thing. All of them, as Courtney Harding reported, had long since got off their medications. 
Okay, she said it is a myth that people need to be on their medication for life. Then we have the World Health Organization study that found outcomes are better where the drugs are selectively used. Then there's a final study of this done by the NIMH by Martin Harrow. He followed a group of schizophrenia patients in the early, um, from the early 1980s. What did he find at the end of 15 years? The recovery rate for those off medication was 40%. The recovery rate for those on medication was 5%. So once again, you see the same sort of thing. Finally, if you go back, imagine we had a form of care that looked at this, that tried to avoid immediate use of the drugs, and then also tried to minimize people on the drugs long term. What sort of outcomes would you get? Luckily, in northern Finland, they've been doing this since 1992. It's an evidence-based solution, and, here, and here's their outcomes. At the end of five years of their first episode psychotic patients, 85% are working or back in school. Only 15% are on disability. In terms of medication use, about one-third have been exposed to antipsychotics, and 20% are on the drugs long-term. So that tells you an evidence-based story in which we could do things much better. It's not a no-drug story. It's not an anti-med story. It's what history tells you how we could really promote better long-term outcomes. So that's the story of antipsychotics. I'm getting the sign that maybe I better wrap this up quickly. Basically, you see that same sort of... Uh, it's, it's a little different for it, but do you, with depression, you see that depression has moved from an episodic to a chronic illness. With bipolar, from an episodic to a chronic illness. Employment rates for bipolar have gone from 85% to 35% today. People with bipolar did not used to show signs of cognitive decline. They do today. They're much more symptomatic than they used to be. This actually is openly acknowledged in the research literature. As far as the kids, the kids is a national tragedy when you look at long-term outcomes. What are you seeing in kids medicated, particularly on the cocktails? You're seeing actually cognitive decline. You're seeing more severe psychiatric symptoms. You're seeing disability crop up every, everywhere. Real quickly, the NIMH did one long-term study of ADHD. Patients on medication, being on, being on medication became a marker for deterioration long-term. Last story, I'll, 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 I'll sign it up. Here's the thing. These long-term studies never get reported to the public. They get hushed up. Now, if psychiatry were doing its duty to society, they would be telling you these studies, and they would be coming up for this evidence-based rationale where drugs were used in a more selective and cautious, cautious use, okay? And we would try to minimize long-term use. Some people, again, I do believe benefit even long-term, but we have this big problem. And then I, as a journalist, would not having be having to write this heretical story. The only reason I'm in here, the only reason I'm going over the scientific evidence is, is unfortunately, it's being hushed up. It's being kept from the public. You go to all these studies, the long-term studies, time and time again, they do not appear in the, in the, in the literature. Okay, that's it. I've got a, I got a quiet, I guess, time for a few questions? Thank you. early on that rates of mental illness increased or hospitalizations, I'm not sure which, when SSDI and Medicare became available. How much of a part or how complementary is the availability of those funds? What part does that play in this whole phenomenon? Yeah, that, that's a fantastic question, okay? so. One of the things is maybe uh, we have a government more willing to uh, say people are disabled by mental illness and provide this funding, okay? So in other words, that could be an explanation for why we have this extraordinary rise from 1987 to 2007 in the number of people on disability due to mental illness. I think that is part of it, okay? And I'll give you an example. Before, there was a time when if you had a mood disorder, depression or bipolar, those were not seen as disabling disorders. Most people got past the depression, past the bipolar, and they were expected to go back to work. It was seen as episodic. But they did get sort of redefined as chronic disorders. Now they actually get redefined once people are medicated and they start becoming more symptomatic, more chronically ill. You see this switch. But here's sort of, my, I know this is a complicated answer. Do I think that's part of it? Yes. I actually do think that's part of it. I also think it's part of the, the, the rise in the number of children on SSI. We're sort of saying to ourselves, these are chronic disorders, these are disabling orders, disorders, and so we'll open up this channel of support. Now, that might explain everything except for this. When I look at the changing course of disorders, long-term course, of medicated depression versus unmedicated depression, you definitely see this change from an episodic illness to a chronic illness. 
You see that in the literature. With the bipolar, you see it from an episodic to much more chronic, okay, more symptomatic. You see, in fact, em employment rates going down. You see the cognitive decline. So those things tell you that the medications are helping to contribute to this chronicity problem. That's number one. And you all, I didn't really have time on this, you really do see these iatrogenic pathways where you take someone with mild depression, they, let's say they have a manic episode, they end up bipolar, and now they're on to a, a more severe course. And what do you see what's happening with children? Same sort of thing. You put kids, uh, uh, you diagnose them with ADHD. So this is a mi relatively minor problem. They're not sitting still in school and class, doing particularly well in class. Uh, at least about 10% of those kids will have a psychotic, manic episode in response to the stimulants. When that happens, they move on to a bipolar diagnosis. Then they're put on a cocktail that includes an antipsychotic. Now they're really in trouble because those cocktails, they, they, they diminish, they make them lethargic, they may make them less emotionally engaged. You do see cognitive decline setting in long term. They are just really problematic. So we have this thing where you take a kid who's fidgeting and years later he's on this cocktail. He's really on a path to lifelong mental patient. So great question. I actually do think that the, the change in cultural standards has contributed to that rise. But we also have this problem with the medications themselves and how they're used. And I do want to say, emphasize, I do believe medications have a place. They clearly can help in acute episodes. And some people do stabilize well on them. And one of the nice things about the Finnish program with the first episode, psychotic patients, they're figuring out who needs them and who doesn't. OK, and you really see that's not an anti-med thing. That's a best use uh, policy. Other question? Until you mentioned the Finnish program, it seemed to me that maybe there was an expectation in certain parts of the world that you just have to function and that if there was just no option for drugs um, so that there was a certain level of functioning that people could do that maybe in places like this country where drugs are easily available and it's nicer to have drugs, you can take them and go on with your life and just be more functioning. Um, do you see that possible with more of the maybe less critical illnesses? Because it seems that there's so many people who have found they help their everyday lives. Or is it, sure. did you look at that as well? Yeah, uh, this is another good question. Um, so the focus of this book, of course, is why the rising disability numbers, okay? So that immediately puts you into a focus on what may be going wrong. Does that, does that make sense? And are we with these major disorders, say major depression, et cetera, do, are we seeing greater chronicity? I'm looking at that long term. And then I am looking at these iatrogenic pathways. But let's say we have a large number of people, and I actually believe this is true, and I think this is your question. Yeah, your question had many parts. And let's say people sort of have, they're, they're already functioning, okay? And let's say they're anxious or just sort of uncomfortable in life, and then they go on an SSRI. And then maybe they're on a single low dose of SRI and they're on a single drug. And five years later, they're saying, wow, I do so much better. Now, I hear that story over and over again. And actually, I think it, one of the reasons we do believe in this form of care, that there is a large population of people out there that come in with a, a milder problem, OK? And let's say it's just anxiety. And actually, it's more anxiety, sort of just irritation. They'll get on an SSRI, for example, and that'll just take the edge off a bit. And actually, now they are functioning better. And I think that becomes a big voice in our society for uh, believing in the medications. And again, I have met many, many, many people in that category. And I think this is why this is important to really, so what do I want with this book? It's to have a full body discussion, OK? And there's nothing in this full body discussion that says we can't acknowledge that truth, OK? That some people apparently do really well. Uh, especially if they come in with this sort of milder problem. But we also need to look at this long-term outcomes data, and we, we need to look at data that shows if we want to improve psychotic episodes, we really need to use the antipsychotics in this sort of selective way. We do have to confront this, these iatrogenic pathways that exist. We do have to confront the, f the fact that the major depression runs a much more chronic course today than it used to in the unmedicated era. By the way, the NIMH looked at this in the 1990s, early 2000s. They had a, a six-year study that compared the, the fate of people who got treated for depression, major depression, and those who did not. 
Um, actually, it was those who got treated had something like a three times higher risk of cessation of primary role function and a seven times higher risk of disability. Similar study was done in Canada. We need, we need to incorporate that information as well. We do have to figure out what the heck's going on with the decline in bipolar outcomes. By the way, if you go into the research literature, there are, there are, this is, is actually a concern. You will see mainstream people saying like, we think it's the antidepressants and we think it's the antipsychotics. So that's not just me. So I love this question. What we really need as a society is this full, open, honest discussion, air all this information. And we don't, I don't really think it means you throw the psychiatric medications out the window. We figure out when they can help and when they, when they harm. But if we do not have a discussion that includes when Martin Harrell reports that 40% of schizophrenia patients off meds recovered, that didn't appear in any American newspaper. The best NIMH study we have, it never appeared in an American newspaper until I gave a talk out in Worcester, and it finally appeared. Well, that needs to be headlines when it happens. And then psychiatrists can, can, can we can discuss this, how better to use the medications. So I'm really glad you, you did this, because I honestly believe there are some group of people that f have found the drugs very helpful, and, and that's great and that should be incorporated into how we use them, but we need this, we need to know all this information. And, okay, sorry. I hope I answered your question. One more, and then we'll have to close it up so people can come and talk to Okay. Um, thank you. <clears throat> I was wondering, you mentioned some studies with first world or the richer countries versus the third world countries, and the there was an unexpected result of a improvement, a long-term um, improvement in uh, the schizophrenic patients. And you mentioned sort of the idea that perhaps um, drug use was either um, less or was less followed. And I'm, I'm wondering, was there also any attempt to see if there's any societal or um, family or work type of patterns or issues that were present or not present, like in the third world, that made it easier for people to do better in the long term? Is there right. other factors besides drug? Medication usage. Medication. And this actually goes a little bit to your question, too, is if in some of these other cultures where there maybe isn't a disability system, right? Um, and, people, and maybe people can go work out in the fields or whatever it might be. There might be lesser stressful things. Um, they, that actually was the hypothesis or the solution that uh, the mainstream psychiatry settled on. That somehow in the poorer countries of the world, uh, you know, that people could have, there was sort of more community support, number one. Number two, in fact, they didn't have a disability system, so they had to find some job. Um, and that in, in turn, the fact that they're still in society actually becomes sort of healing on its own, okay? They're not isolated. I believe all that is true. Okay, that those are all factors and they're not just idle explanations. The only thing I think you have to work in at the same time is, A, we did see that it's possible to recover without, you know, without staying on medications long term in those societies. And by the way, in those WHO studies, they eventually came back and looked at long term and the, in the, the, those patients in those studies, they were really doing long, 20 years later, really doing well. That's number one. And two, we do have to look at our own studies back in the 70s, and then also the Finnish studies, to improve long-term outcomes and higher employment rates. You want to use the meds in this sort of selective ways. And you actually want to try to avoid putting people down the medication path because it's so problematic. So the, my answer to you is, are there cultural factors involved in the WHO studies? Absolutely. What can we learn from them? Well, we can learn that maybe if you can keep people working, that's good. And if you can people provide cultural support, that's good as well. And don't isolate them in sort of disabled situations. But we also need to adjust our use of antipsychotic medications. I and mean, the, the long-term stuff, the MRI studies where you see cognitive decline, increasing lethargy, that really does tell you that you want to try to minimize the use and not maximize the use. Thank you.